Mormonism teaches that trillions of planets scattered throughout the cosmos are ruled by countless gods who once were human like us. They say that long ago on one of these planets, to an unidentified god and one of his goddess wives, a spirit child named Elohim was conceived. This spirit child was later born to human parents who gave him a physical body. Through obedience to Mormon teaching and death and resurrection, he proved himself worthy and was elevated to godhood as his father before him. Mormons believe that Elohim is their heavenly father and that he lives with his many goddess wives on a planet near a mysterious star called Korah. Here the god of Mormonism and his wives through endless celestial sex produced billions of spirit children. To decide their destiny, the head of the Mormon gods called a great heavenly council meeting. Both of Elohim's eldest sons were there, Lucifer and his brother Jesus. A plan was presented to build planet Earth, where the spirit children would be sent to take on mortal bodies and learn good from evil. Lucifer stood and made his bid for becoming savior of this new world. Wanting the glory for himself, he planned to force everyone to become gods. Opposing the idea, the Mormon Jesus suggested giving man his freedom of choice, as on other planets. The vote that followed approved the proposal of the Mormon Jesus, who would become savior of the planet Earth. Enraged, Lucifer cunningly convinced one-third of the spirits destined for Earth to fight with him in revolt. Thus, Lucifer became the devil and his followers the demons. Sent to this world, they would forever be denied bodies of flesh and bone. Those who remained neutral in the battle were cursed to be born with black skin. This is the Mormon explanation for the Negro race. The spirits that fought most valiantly against Lucifer would be born into Mormon families on planet Earth. These would be the lighter-skinned people, or white and delightsome, as the Book of Mormon describes them. Early Mormon prophets taught that Elohim and one of his goddess wives came to Earth as Adam and Eve to start the human race. Thousands of years later, Elohim, in human form once again, journeyed to Earth from the star base Kola, this time to have sex with the Virgin Mary, in order to provide Jesus with a physical body. Mormon apostle Orson Pratt taught that after Jesus Christ grew to manhood, he took at least three wives, Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene. Through these wives, the Mormon Jesus, for whom Joseph Smith claimed direct descent, supposedly fathered a number of children before he was crucified. According to the Book of Mormon, after his resurrection, Jesus came to the Americas to preach to the Indians, who the Mormons believe are really Israelites. Thus, the Jesus of Mormonism established his church in the Americas as he had in Palestine. By the year 421 A.D., the dark-skinned Indian Israelites, known as Lamanites, had destroyed all of the white Nephites in a number of great battles. The Nephites' records were supposedly written on golden plates and buried by Moroni, the last living Nephite in the hill Cumorah. Fourteen hundred years later, a young treasure seeker named Joseph Smith who was known for his tall tales, claimed to have uncovered these same gold plates near his home in upstate New York. He is now honored by Mormons as a prophet because he claimed to have had visions from the spirit world in which he was commanded to organize the Mormon church because all Christian creeds were an abomination. 
It was Joseph Smith who originated most of these peculiar doctrines which millions today believe to be true. By maintaining a rigid code of financial and moral requirements and through performing secret temple rituals for themselves and the dead, the Latter-day Saints hope to prove their worthiness and thus become gods. The Mormons teach that everyone must stand at the final judgment before Joseph Smith, the Mormon Jesus, and Elohim. Those Mormons who were sealed in the eternal marriage ceremony expect to become polygamous gods in the celestial kingdom, rule over other planets, and spawn new families throughout eternity. The Mormons thank God for Joseph Smith, who claimed that he had done more for us than any other man, including Jesus Christ. The Mormons believe that he died as a martyr, shed his blood for us, so that we too may become gods. Anyway, so the ten points of theology are bibliology. You guys could probably, you know, if you sat down and thought about it, you would come up with these as well because they're kind of going a progression. But the doctrine of scripture. So Mormons have a false doctrine of scripture. There's theology proper, which is the doctrine of God or specifically of, you know, maybe God the Father. Uh, so, you know, they obviously, as you saw in that video, they have a doctrine of God that is incorrect. So one of the things you could do, if you want to focus in on a certain area, maybe someone is really good at, okay, I'm going to study the cross, I'm going to study the person of Christ, I'm going to study the person of God. You could read A.W. Pink's The Attributes of God, which is a short book, refresh you know, your mind on, okay, what are, what are the true attributes of God? And you'll see, okay, what's well, not the God of Mormonism. So you could bring it back to them and say, well, it says in Scripture that God is not a man. <laughs> it says in Scripture that he's eternal and all these different things. That he doesn't have a body, that he's immaterial. Uh, that a spirit does not have flesh and bone, which Jesus said in a different context. Uh, there's Christology, the doctrine of Christ. They have to make a, every false religion makes a false Christ. Pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this one is pretty weird, too. It's not as well-known as some of the other ones in Mormonism, but that's in there, too. Anthropology, they have... Uh, whoops, that's not correct. Anthropology is supposed to be a doctrine of humans, the doctrine of man. So, obviously, they believe that we can become gods, that we don't have a sin nature, that we choose to sin just because, that Adam didn't pass his sin nature on to us, uh, this is, okay, this is the correct, you know when you correct one slide and it doesn't, and you didn't correct one before, that's what happened. And then there's hamartiology, hamartios is the word in Greek for sin. Uh, so it's the doctrine of sin, they don't believe, you have to make a lesser sin uh, in order to make a false system of salvation work. If it's not all of God, you have to lessen uh, what sin actually is. So they believe the sin, for example, the sin of Adam and Eve was a good thing because it allowed it allowed them to receive eternal life eventually, something like that. It's, it's in uh, my notes. It's been a while since I've gone over it. But they believe the sin of Adam and Eve was actually a good thing, that it should be celebrated because, oh, because it allowed them to have the knowledge of God and become like God. And, uh, so really, the devil is the hero in, the, in that story. Uh, soteriology, a doctrine of faith or salvation. Obviously, they have a whole view of salvation that's warped because of all these they all affect each other uh, ecclesiology the doctrine of the church they believe they're the one true church on earth um, angelology for whatever reason it's weird in uh, in cults and in other false religions for some reason they always have a weird doctrine of angels <laughs> that, that's one way to actually test if uh, if a church is doctrinally sound, you can go in and see what you can go in and read their doctrinal statement on angels. And if it's off on angels, for whatever reason, they're off somewhere else. I don't know why. I don't know why the doctrine of angels is so like people have so many weird, freaky views about angels. Um, it's it's you know an angel came to me in a dream. An angel did this or this or that. Uh, you saw the view of Satan in that video as well. 
And then there's eschatology, a doctrine of last things. And they have a warped view of that as well. But uh, go over a little bit about their doctrine of scripture. But first off, um, Mormonism, there's a difference between Mormonism, which is a cult. Why is this pen working? Another. Another. <laughs> Mormonism's a cult, and that is different from an apostate church or a false church. I mean, it's a false church. I mean, but it's it's distinguished from an apostate church. You guys know the difference between a cult, uh, what, an, what a cult is, and what an apostate church is, or maybe some examples of each one. Would a cult be like it never even started out right? Yes. With any good views that they just make up their own crap, an apostate church would be like a biblical church that all of a sudden just drifted from all of a sudden, sudden, but yeah, they decided. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's exactly it. A cult, uh, an apostate church is something like Roman Catholicism Mm -hmm. uh, that at one time did have the truth. Uh, Roman, the Roman church at one time uh, before the medieval times did have the true gospel, did have a true view of, uh, of fundamental matters. They went away from those things, and now the, the, uh, it became an apostate church is why there was a reformation to try to bring it back. Now the uh, Catholic church is unreformable. There's no, uh, there's no way to bring it back to a true view of the church. I don't, most people, most Christians acknowledge that the Roman Catholic church is not something that we're going to bring back into orthodoxy or truth. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, other things, they're a cult, and they're not like a sociological cult where you like drink the Kool-Aid and, <laughs> and go to a, some other planet or something like that. A cult is something that uh, claims to be Christianity, which the Mormons do, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They claim to be Christian, but their, all their fundamental doctrines are opposed to uh, the fundamental doctrines of Christianity. Their Christ is a different Christ. Their God is a different God. They don't believe scripture. They don't believe justification by faith alone. They don't believe in grace alone. They don't believe in uh, all kinds of things. So they, while saying that they're Christian, they're something totally uh, opposed to Christianity. And yet Mormons will say, oh, but well, we're Christians. You know, we're part of, and it's like, no, you're not. You're, you're not Christians. And that's something that has to be uh, made clear to them. So they kind of work on what's called a bait and switch. It's where you offer something that looks like something good. You offer the bait, and then at the last second, you switch it out with something like this. So like Mormon missionaries who come to your door, they're not going to be like, well, hello, we believe in multiple gods. Elohim had sex with the Virgin Mary and produced Jesus. Jesus wasn't God from eternity past. They're not going to say these things. They're going to be like, we believe that Uh, that the Bible and the Book of Mormon have very many things in common and that the Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ. And we believe in a modern prophet today and, and, you know, family and conservative values, all kinds of different stuff. You have to push them a little bit, but they will eventually be forced to admit this stuff. But they won't tell you that uh, right out of the the gate because that would scare people or or people would recognize even unchristian people would be like, well, that's not Christianity. Don't people believe Jesus is God? <laughs> you know, that type of thing. You know, a non-Christian can do that. So that's why I'm, uh, I offer the people should do not what I call bumper sticker theology, like, well, you believe in polygamy, or, you know, drive, kind of like a drive-by. <laughs> like, <laughs> you roll down the window and you're like, <laughs> Jesus doesn't save, or whatever. You know, that you actually have to go, there are... Jesus is God! Yeah, there are way worse things at the root of their foundations. You don't have to even deal with the branches. If you can get to the root, the gospel, character of God, all those things, they make God man, they make man God, all those things, then those will be the things uh, you should deal with. But let me show you um, some of the 
bibliology, the doctrine of scripture of Mormonism. So Mormonism has a false doctrine of scripture. I posted this, it's actually kind of funny on, uh, I did a presentation on Mormonism last year uh, at a Bible study and recorded and posted on YouTube and my little booklet is called A, a Brief Theology of Mormonism. I posted on YouTube and this lady comments who I don't even know and she's like, this is not a theology, this is not a theology of Mormonism, this is an attack on Mormon theology. I'm like, yeah, it's true. I'm like, I, I wasn't, <laughs> it's a Christian apologetic against Mormonism. I guess uh, should have labeled it more clearly, but <laughs> I was like, I can send you my book if you give me your email. And she's like, she never responded. But, but I mean, I start out with points like this, that Mormonism has a false doctrine of scripture. Uh, here's one of the things uh, that they believe, and I'll, I'll make these available, maybe a video or something, and you guys have all these quotes in the thing I sent you. Uh, these are just some of the things to go back to and read up on. You have to know the, the, the most important thing for you to do is read the Bible, the New Testament, read good Christian theology, things like that. Just if you become an expert on the New Testament, that's that's the best way you uh, that you become better in apologetics or sharing the gospel. Um, you can know other things and learn about Mormonism, but don't leave off. Okay, well, I'm just going to become an expert in Mormonism because then you'd have to be an expert in everything, and that's not even possible. So just become an expert in truth and just keep going back to truth. But these are some things to know about Mormonism. Uh, so they say, their Gospel Principles book says, in addition to these four books of Scripture, meaning the Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrines and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price, uh, the inspired words of our living pro prophets become Scripture to us. So they have living people who are speaking Scripture to them now. Uh, they're not as hard on that as they used to be because now their prophets don't make predictions about the future and they're, they don't take their words as seriously as they used to because that started getting them into issues. There's also this, where they, this is what they'll pretty much quote, eighth article of faith. We believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. See, that's the key. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the word of God. So the Book of Mormon makes up for what the Bible lacks, is what their, uh, what their point is, what they're saying there, that the Bible, uh, it's not translated correctly. Just inherently, they don't say anything bad about the Bible. Oh, we believe the Bible to be the word of God, but there's a contingency. There's a, there's a condition on it. Interesting that there's no stipulation about the Book yeah, of Mormon. No, it's not like, oh, well, the Book of Mormon, as far it as it's translated God. correctly, because they think, oh, well, there's multiple translations of the Bible, the golden plates just came to Joseph Smith and he just translated once, which isn't true, but that's, that's what they believe. So there's also the uh, Mormon teaching on Revelation in general, not the book of Revelation. And it says, we believe that all that God has revealed and all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So that's huge. And that's huge uh, for anyone to say that, that God is still revealing essential truths about the kingdom of God now. Uh, the gospel was the introduction of the kingdom of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that was it. The, it closed off because there was a, it's kind of like when, those, when the rocket takes off and then leaves behind the, the other part of the rocket and then keeps flying. That's kind of how it was to get the, the gospel off the ground. There were miracles, there were healings, there was the teaching of Jesus himself, there was the apostles that laid the foundation of the church, and then there was the written word of God, which is what we have now. And so we're not going to be looking for a new word. We're going to be looking back to scripture and just preaching the gospel and the kingdom of God. But they're, they're saying that there's important things that haven't been revealed or that can be revealed today. That's the opposite of what we believe. We believe scripture is sufficient. And that this can mean also that there's no complete uh, salvation. Uh, we believe that scripture is complete, closed, and that it's universal. That Jesus affirmed the Old Testament and that he authorized his representatives to introduce the New Testament. And that that was it. Unless someone is authorized by Christ, which they would argue they are, but they are not, that, uh, that they cannot speak on behalf of Christ. And Christ only authorized a certain amount of people to 
pen additional revelation that would be the word of God to look back to Jesus, to explain what Jesus did, and to look ahead to the coming of Christ. And if you think about what the Bible includes, it includes the beginning from God, and then it ends with revelation to where we'll worship God forever and eternity. So, and everything in between. So I don't know what they think that these other prophets are going to bring in at the last minute, but uh, between now and then, if we have to the end of the age and we have from the beginning, I, I don't understand what they're uh, issue is I understand it. It's wrong though, but <laughs> but when they need like paradise and the time there to you know figure out full knowledge, right? They can't know full knowledge until like the last second. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but when Paul wrote something like Paul, an apostle by the will of God to the saints, and this is how he began most of his letters in most of the New Testament epistles, it, it's, that writing showed that since he was an apostle and it was to the saints, it was for all people in all places at all times, that it was sufficient for everyone, that it was a universal message. Um, the only way there could be a new revelation is if a whole new gospel was created. And Paul says if there's any other gospel, that it's, that it's a false gospel. But that's what the Mormons did. They created a whole other gospel. They're to be rejected as counterfeits. But so God has spoken in many ways, Hebrews 1. Through many times he's spoken many different ways, but now he's spoken through his son. And you think about the fact that the Mormons talk about a living prophet. Well, Jesus is our living prophet. He's spoken to us through his word. We have his spirit. There's not something that can come over and supersede Jesus or fill up where he Lacks, but the church was built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. And they'll be like, oh, this is why we need apostles and prophets today, and why we can be apostles and prophets. But if you think about what an apostle and a prophet is, or what a foundation is, and a foundation is something that's laid down, and it's laid down once, and then it is built upon. You don't lay down a foundation at one level, and then, okay, 10 years later, I'm going to lay a new foundation on the third floor, and then we're going to do another foundation. You only lay down a foundation once, and a foundation is only, uh, you continue building on it. Paul even said, 1 Corinthians 3.11, there's no foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ. And Christ, and, and the teaching of the apostles, which was focused on Christ. So there's no need for all this further stuff. We have the gospel Revealed, but this is what uh, the Mormons believe. So it's antithetical to so just the idea that any group can say that they have new scripture is is against the Christian message and the sufficiency of what Christ did. He built his church, and he laid the foundation of his church. Uh, but they said after the Savior ascended into heaven, because they don't want to blame Jesus, after the uh, the Savior ascended into heaven, men changed the ordinances and doctrines that he and his apostles established. Because of apostasy, there was no direct revelation from God. The true church was no longer on earth. So they believe that there are all these changes made to the Bible, so that the Bible was lost in translation, that men, after the death of the apostles, wor reworked the whole Bible, which is impossible, by the way, historically, because the Bible was preached evangelistically, and it spread so far out that anyone who wanted to change it had to get a hold of every single copy and change it and get them back to where they were supposed to be uh, without anyone noticing over 300 years in three different continents in three different languages. So it's we have those manuscripts. We have we have several manuscripts from a couple within a couple hundred years of when Jesus lived, and that's better than any other uh, type of manuscript. And and you know there are some mistakes, but they're manuscript mistakes. They're not mistakes in the original documents. It's like one um, there's a word in Greek. Uh, we'll go over this at some other point, but there's a word in Greek that's like uh, hippo something, and hippo in Greek means horse. And so someone like a slave or something was copying down a manuscript of scripture, and he accidentally misspelled a word, and so it translated that it was horse. Well, obviously, horse wasn't the meaning of what was, uh, what was in the New Testament. It was some other word that meant like savior or something like that. So there are those type of mistakes. There are spelling errors. There are things like that. But you can compare all the manuscripts to each other, and we can keep looking back at better manuscripts and saying, getting more clarity. It's like having a thousand-piece puzzle with a thousand and three pieces. So you can figure out what the original meaning is. If you have a 998-piece puzzle and that is supposed to be a thousand pieces, then you have problems. But that's not what the Bible is. Uh, so, 
so they believe there's no direct revelation on God that Joseph Smith had to be brought about to restore the true church, that there was no true church on earth because there was no direct revelation from God, because the Bible couldn't be trusted. Uh, so this is what the Mormons teach uh, about the Bible. They say many important points touching the salvation of men had been taken from the Bible or lost before it was compiled. Meaning while they were trying to get together the 66 books that make up the Bible, not just little things got left out, not a couple little you know, statements about uh, you know, what to do in the church nursery or something like that. It was important truths touching salvation were lost. Therefore, they needed to be returned by, by another uh, restoration of the gospel. And that's what they'll call it in their, their propaganda movie of Joseph Smith. They call it prophet, Joseph Smith, Prophet of the Restoration. And so they say that it was lost before it was compiled. And there's no evidence for this. They'll just, you know, they'll refer back to, uh, the, you know, the typical Da Vinci Code argument. Yeah, men change the Bible and all that stuff, which is not true. But they say it specifically is about salvation. Those are the things that were. Uh, they say it just in general. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, they'll say, well, yeah, you know, the true salvation is through the Mormon Church. That's why you guys have an insufficient salvation just going from the Bible. So that's what their conclusion. Even like the Old Testament. Uh, yeah, I would say it's more focused on the New Testament since that's okay. more about, but I would, yeah, I don't know actually what they would say to that. The Old Testament, it's, it was pretty settled by the time of Christ. Right. So, right. so how I, would that, yeah, yeah, true. Changed. And Jesus believed the Old Testament. So I don't know, actually, that'd be a good question to ask a Mormon person. <laughs> um, Many insertions were made, some of them slanted for selfish purposes, meaning they were trying to change the doctrine, make Jesus other than he was, while at times deliberate falsifications and fabrications were perpetrated. So they're, so they're purposely, tr- yeah, exactly, they're, they're putting on Christians what the Mormons do today, and they're saying Christians did this thousands of years ago. So we're just going to do it now. Yeah, and so that they can change it. To, I mean, they have to. They have to make people doubt the Bible. That's what. Uh, that's what Satan did to Adam and Eve in the beginning. Was he said, "Did God really say? Like, are you sure you interpreted it correctly? Did he really mean it? Is it really true? Is it really authoritative? Is it really infallible? I mean, that's. It's all connected in that. Has God said? And he twists the scripture a little bit in Genesis three. He says, "Has God said you can't eat from any tree?" And then Eve is like, no, just from this one. And so she, the seed of doubt sowed against the, the word of God. And that's how they uh, bring in their doctrine. But, but you know, one or two or 30 um, evil monks who want to change the doctrine, well, that may work for one area, but scripture was all over different continents and uh, different times and was being used. And pe- there was clear knowledge that people knew what the Bible was even before uh, within a hundred years of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And that's no other uh, document has that type of, um, has that type of evidence for it. Uh, but there's also, this one it doesn't come up as much, but there's also the Joseph Smith translation. Uh, he made his own, and it's also, I have in my notes here, that's also called the inspired translation of the Bible, that he had to correct the Bible for us. And so this is, um, this, it's kind of basically the, now you guys understand what a translation is, right? I, I'm not a, a translation, you have to understand sp- like specifically what it means because a translation means you go back to an original language and you, you study texts that are in an original language. Like you could, uh, the Message Bible, for example, is not a translation. It's a, it's a, they re, it's a paraphrase. They rephrase the English. A translation means you go back to a manuscript and it shows you what to write and you write it down. That's what a translation means. So he's calling this a Joseph Smith translation, but what he did was take the King James Version and just change words around and change meanings around without any, any evidence that he ever translated Greek. There, I don't even know if there's evidence that he even knew Greek. And if he did, that may be even worse because he, he knew what he was doing. But here's one example. We all know John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The, Logos, the Word was with God. And the Word was God. 
this is his version of John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son, and the gospel was the Word, and the Word was with the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. Now, they don't usually use the Joseph Smith translation, but you should know it's out there. Uh, they usually use the King James Bible along with their other, uh, with the Book of Mormon and their other things. They have something that they call the triple that includes Book of Mormon, uh, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price, and they may have a King, King James Bible with them. They have to dust off. They have to dust that one off. And <laughs> go back to, I asked one guy, uh, I didn't think about it this way at the time, but it was kind of funny. It worked out this way. I was talking to a guy who came to our door years ago, and he asked. I was trying to share the gospel with him. I'm like, "Can you turn to Habakkuk 2:13, 1:13?" And you know, back it's a, a small book within the minor prophets, and so he's like trying to find. Habakkuk in this, you know, in the Old Testament, and most, you know, some Christians wouldn't know where that is unless they knew the books of the Bible song or something like that. So it was kind of funny, but uh, he found it eventually. Wait, that's a book. He's like, "How do you pronounce that?" Habakkuk. <laughs> so that's one of them. Here's another one that's huge. Uh, Romans. Uh, let me read you Romans. Where's my Bible? Romans four five. Read the real version, so I don't. Maybe I have it here. Okay, let me read it myself. Just a sec. Okay, Romans four five <laughs> says, uh, "But to the one who does not work, but believes on believes in him who justifies the ungodly." his faith is accounted for righteousness. Now that's a pretty shocking verse because to justify means God declares someone righteous. Not that he just declares them not guilty, not just he, just as if I'd never sinned. That's not what it means. It means God legally says that you are righteous, as righteous as Christ. Now God does that to ungodly people. Now that's, that's what you have to push to people that it was only through the sacrifice of Christ. So, we get there that God does and is able to legally justify the ungodly. But this is Joseph Smith's translation. But to him that seeketh not to be justified by the law of works, but believeth on him who justifieth not the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So it's like when someone tells you something and they're like, not. Yeah, <laughs> oh, your shirt looks cool. Opposite. Not. So one word makes it the opposite meaning and there's no reason to believe that there's there's no greek manuscript that says that leads someone to write that but he you know said that this was the inspired version of it so he just changed it for his own to fit his own doctrine is what happened uh let me see sandra tanner needless to say there is no manuscript evidence for joseph smith's additions She's like, she's going over all the differences and the things, in it, and then she hit, concludes by saying, oh, and by the way, there's nowhere he got this from. <laughs> so, so, let me go, okay, we'll finish off with the Mormon teaching on the Book of Mormon. Their main text, the Book of Mormon, it actually, surprisingly, there are, it is wrong that it was created. Uh, it has major doctrinal, theological, biblical errors in it. Um, it is heresy, it is false. However, the, the Book of Mormon is not doctrinally that different from the theology of the New Testament. It's not, it's not a, it's a ton of it was co basically copied and pasted from the New Testament, which is how they, like you said, it's scary because that's how they get in. Uh, lots of Mormons, even after they get saved and reject Mormonism, still have hold on to the Book of Mormon for a year or two. Because, without knowing it, they've been reading passages of actual scripture, like it takes out a ton of Isaiah, and they haven't realized it. Sandra Tanner said for like a couple years after she got saved that she still held on to the Book of Mormon because it was so hard to let that go. But it claims to be another testament of Jesus Christ. It doesn't, it, it's to both be comparable to the Bible. It's the cornerstone of Mormonism, uh, but we have to see what it says about itself. So this is what Joseph Smith said about the Book of Mormon. Whoops, oh, here it is. I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. 
And a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts by, than by any other book. Now think about what that says indirectly about the Bible. Mm-hmm. That the Bible is not the most correct book on earth. That the Bible is not the book to use to get closest to God. That it can help, but it can't get you as close to God as the Book of Mormon. And then it's uh, the keystone of Mormonism. And so that, that's an indirect statement that the Bible is not uh, enough. But we saw, I'm not going to go over this right now, but we saw the, the video of uh, kind of the overview of the Book of Mormon. That You have the, these different groups. You can read about this a little bit later, but I'll skip it for now. Uh, this is how the Book of Mormon was translated. This is Joseph Smith, History of the Church. He said, We heard a voice from the bright light above us saying, These plates have been revealed by the power of God, and they have been translated by the power of God. The translation of them which you have seen is correct, and I command you to bear record of what you now see and hear. So God, they said they had this, the three, the, they had this uh, vision of God who told them to do it. And how Joseph translated, he didn't sit down with the golden plates and go, okay, this word from this language means this. He, we don't know if the gold plates even existed. We don't know what the language supposedly was. If there was, then we could say, oh, well, this is obviously some type of old ancient language, but all we see is the English version. So we don't know that a translation ever actually happened because for a translation, you have to have a knowledge of a language. And, so, and you have to have original manuscripts to go back to. But there, the Book of Mormon uh, supposedly went back up to heaven. Conveniently. Yeah. So, and the fact is, uh, we'll talk about it in a minute, but Joseph Smith changed his translation. Well, where did he get the idea to change it from? If you, unless you have competing manuscripts, unless you have something that makes uh, and a language that makes it more clear that, oh, well, maybe I should have phrased it this way, then you can't edit your manuscript. If you only have one thing to take from, you only get it once. There's no, uh, you, you don't go back and, oh, I mis- misread. If the translation is true the first time and God gave it to you, then I don't see how you could have this, uh, have new translations. Uh, but this is how he actually translated it. David Whitmer, one of the witnesses of the Book of Mormon, there were three, um, he writes, I will now give you a description of the manner in which the Book of Mormon was translated. Joseph Smith would put the seer stone into a hat. I'll stop there for a minute. His seer stone in the 1800s, this is what people would use to find treasure. And, you know, they would, it was a witchcraft type of weird, freaky thing that people would do. A lot of people did it. You'd buy it from like a huckster who would sell it on the side of the road. Like Mr. Moore played in VBS. You remember that the cowboy VBS? Were you guys here for that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, he played this guy who was like uh, one of those gypsy traveling salesmen. That sells you this tonic to make you yeah. make everything better. Well, anyway, so th- those guys would go around and sell them. Joseph Smith and his dad were infamous for buying this kind of stuff and trying to find treasure and looking in this hat at this stone that event- that you know gave them some direction to go find treasure on people's property and all kinds of different stuff. So anyway, they put the stone this stone into a hat and put the hat over the ha- face, drawing it closely around the face to exclude light. And in the darkness, the spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling parchment would appear, and on it appeared writing. One character at a time would appear, and under the interpretation in English. So even in the translation, it's not like Joseph Smith sitting down with his translation books of the golden plates and going, okay, this word here from this dictionary of Reform Ancient Egyptian, which is not a language, means this, and going over and carefully writing it down. He set the golden plates over somewhere else, if they were there at all, put a hat over his face with a rock in it and got a translation. That's not how translation One happens. One character at a time, though. That's what it's we don't know okay. that this, this may... I, I, we don't, we'll never know what actually went on at that time. Like, if he, you know, if they were yeah. making this all up or if they really did this stuff, if they, how, how into it some of these higher-up guys actually were 